Oh, hello. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this webinar, um, which is about the Lesnos Master Plan. We thank you for joining us very much. Um, my name is Sarah Jane and I work for Peabody in the Regen team. Um, we also have a team of people who are going to turn their cameras on and introduce themselves. Um, so, Adam, would you like to go first? Hi, I'm Adam Roberts. I'm Senior Regeneration Manager in the Regeneration team for Peabody. Nice. Irene. Uh, hi, I'm Irene. I work for McCranner Lavington and I'm an urban designer for the master plan. Hi, I'm, I'm Priska Thielman. I also work with Irene for McCranner Lavington Architects. We are the lead master planners on this project. Hello, and I'm Marika. I'm from Farah Huxley, Real Landscape Architects for the master plan. Matthew? Hi, I'm Matthew Fowlis. I'm the Projects Director for Peabody in Thamesmead. Thank you very much. Okay, so just quickly before we start, let me just talk about how this session will run. So um, we're here to obviously give you some overall information about the Lesnes Master Plan Scheme, um, which will be, um, Adam will kind of give you some background and then the architects will show you a, a presentation about the plan and show you um, all the great images. Um, so in the webinar format, um, we can't see you or hear you as your cameras and microphones are disabled. However, you can ask questions in the Q&A button, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, so please put questions in there at any time. Um, and then what we'll do is about halfway through, we'll pick up some questions if they've come in. And then at the end, we will kind of go through the remainder of the questions and try and answer as many as we can as possible. So Adam, um, can I put this over to you, please, just to make a start? Yep, absolutely. Can I ask Irene, could you share the presentation? Brilliant. So thank you for that intro, Sarah Jane. Um, if you can go to the, go forward a few slides. That's the next one. So the Lesnes Estate is um, part of wider change that we're implementing in South Thamesmead. So it's the, the red area here. Uh, to the, you can't see my mouse. It's the the, the red buildings to the south, um, but it's part of the the kind of uh, wider opportunity and um, the work that Peabody are doing in South Thamesmead. So we're we're building around two and a half thousand homes up over a period of um, ten to fifteen years. Um, the heart of that will be a new civic centre at Southmere Village, which will include a new library lots of shops, cafes, restaurants, activity. Um, up to the north of that, um, where Binzi Book used to be located, there'll be, there'll be more homes overlooking the lake. Um, we're also planning, or we've already implemented a range of improvements to the lake itself, uh, with the new rebeds that you'll see if you walk around Southmere Park. Um, and then to the very north of the plan, uh, we, are, we have, made improvements to the Lakeside Centre, uh, which includes a new cafe, artist studios, which are now open for you to visit, or oh, perhaps not at the moment with COVID. And then number three, there is a new boat and sailing club that we're looking to start later this year. Um, so lots of exciting stuff happening in the area. Next slide. In terms of uh, timeframes, Southmere phase one is making really good progress. Um, we're looking to complete the first part of that um, for rehousing in the summer this year. Um, the, the latter part of Southmere phase one should complete by November 2022, and that will include 534 new homes and over 3,000 metres of commercial space squared. Um, Southmere phase two will be the next phase that will follow and that will be 329 homes um, which we're looking to complete um, 2024 um, and perhaps some additional commercial space too um, and then Lesnes is the phase that will follow and the master plan that we've been working on over the last few years that we're going to show you in more detail tonight and that will include up to 1950 new homes and 3,000 metres of commercial space. And this is all in the context of Abbey Wood Station, hopefully opening in uh, around 2022 and the opening of the Elizabeth line. Next slide, please. So 
I don't get the opportunity to go down to Thamesmead as much as I'd like to at the moment for obvious reasons of COVID. But when I have been um, back in December, it's amazing the speed which um, progress is now being made on site. I think even since this image was taken, which I think was around November time, um, a lot of the scaffolding is starting to come down on some buildings and you can really see how the first new homes in South Thamesmead are starting to take shape. Um, the same with the library building that's going up really quickly. So some exciting stuff and we're looking forward to some of that opening um, later this year. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Southmere phase two, um, you'll have seen in the last year or so, we've demolished the existing homes at, um, at Binsey Walk, um, and we're looking to build 329 uh, new homes, um, early designs for which um, have been, uh, the design team starting to work on, sorry, my cat has just broken and it's really distracted me. Um, so that will, that will comprise two, two or three apartment buildings and a tower to the north. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, so the, the context, the rehousing context that we're working in, uh, we're looking to rehouse all residents that wish to stay um, in the area, um, tenants and, and homeowners, um, and give them the opportunity to move to a new home in South Thamesmead. So uh, phase one of the rehousing, so you see the hatched area, will move to South Mere Village, phase one. Uh, it, the orange, hatched area will be phase two of the rehousing and that will move to Binsey Walk or Southmere Village phase two as we're calling it and then the remainder the purple hatched area to the south um, will be given the opportunity to move to Coraline Walk as part which will become part of the Lesnes estate. Um, next slide please. So all assured social and secure tenants who live on the site at the, who live on the estate at the moment will be given the opportunity to rent a new home in South Thamesmead if they wish to or if they wish to move elsewhere within our existing estates in other parts of London we will also help people move there if they wish to. We'll be offering financial compensation and help with moving. Um, for resident homeowners uh, there'll be the opportunity to use the value of their um, their existing home to move to a new home in South Thamesmead or also the opportunity to move anywhere else um, they wish to in the UK and we'll be providing to help bridge the, the value difference and we'll be providing an, an equity offer to help people um, span that gap up to 50% in South Thames Meads or 35% if they want to move anywhere else in the UK and that's like a second charge on your on your mortgage um, it's like an, an interest-free um, almost like an interest-free loan um, we're also offering financial compensation and help with moving for homeowners. Next slide, please. Um, as part of the consultation process uh, for the rehousing offer, since 2016, we've been engaging with residents um, on, the, on the rehousing opportunity and the offer that we're providing. Um, and we, this kind of culminated in March this year, we ran a, an independent ballot um, asking the question um, if residents who live on the estate are happy with, with the rehousing offer and for us to include the Lessons Estate in our generation plans for South Thamesmead. So we were really pleased that 70% of you supported us um, in that and so that was a 65% turnout overall. So a great affirmation for the project to go ahead. Next slide, please. And so in terms of affordable housing, for the new in terms of the new homes that we're building we're looking to uh, we'll be building um 35 percent affordable housing so that's for 1850 units um master plan that's around 650 affordable homes so 12 oh my gosh the cart's gone mad sorry <laughs> um social so um social rent sorry so so 12% of those affordable homes will be for um, social rent tenants who live in, who already live in the Lesnes estate to be rehoused. Uh, around 48% will be people who are on Bexley's housing waiting list. Um, and then the remaining 40% will be shared ownership um, for people who wish to take up that opportunity. Um, and in terms of consultation for the Lesnes master plan uh, itself, um, we've been engaging with you since March 2019 through various stages of the process. So right from the kind of first principles of how should we set up the site, what do people like about the existing neighbourhoods, 
what are the kind of opportunities, what are people's aspirations, um, right through to talking about um, heights and public realm opportunities um, through July 2019, December 2019. And through that kind of iterative approach that's culminated in today's um, event, which is to present to you our, our kind of final master plan proposal. So everything kind of coming together. And now I'm gonna hand over to Prisca Tillman to talk you through um, the proposals. Sorry you, about Adam. the cat interrupting. <laughs> No worries. <laughs> My kids might come in any minute. <laughs> um, so I will take you through together with some colleagues um, through the, the through the master plan. But I'll start with the kind of drier bit, um, because I would like to explain a little bit about uh, what it is we are submission submitting. Um, so it's an outline planning application. Next slide, please. And yeah, we try to summarize here a little bit and illustrate what that means. What is an outline application? So because as a planning application, you can do an outline or a detailed application. So if you were to build a house, uh, you do a detailed application, but an outline, a big master plan is commonly done as an as an outline application, which sets a kind of looser a framework in which future detailed applications, which are called uh, RMAs, will come forward. So in things um, which are uh, fixed in an outline application are the kind of main ideas as a vision for the future of the place. Um, maximum building heights are generally fixed. Then the routes and movement through the site and access to the site gets fixed. Then the number of homes also the size of blocks and kind of roughly where they're built and the uses um, across an area um, all gets established. And uh, perhaps we move to the next slide because that illustrates what's on the right here. So, and, and this gets done in a number of documents and drawings. Uh, so one, um, one important set of drawings are the parameter plans, which you can see an example here on the left. Um, which um, basically set um, where development plots um, will go and also set the height and maybe also and also the route. So you can see this one here where kind of white areas are going to be uh, streets and routes. Um, so those things are set in parameter plans. Um, but then um, in addition to the parameter plans, um, you get something called the design code. So that gives more detail to particular aspects for future designers taking um, um, developing projects with, with, within the framework of the parameter plans. So in this, in this example, it sets out where exactly taller buildings might go, so to ensure overshadowing is hap not happening and so on. But it might also provide quite a lot of detail, um, like um, even down to materials or where front doors might sit, but that's different in every master plan, but we have um, selected all the things that we think are important here to establish in both of these important um, documents. And then out of that, as in the right, will come some future designs. So perhaps maybe just very briefly, just flip back to the slide before. So you'll see, so, you know, if the planning application goes in and you look at all the documents, you will find um, in the online um, uh, planning portal, you can find all these documents and you'll have the, so at the top there, so the um, the documents that become legal guidance are the parameter plans, the design code and the development specification. And then in support of this, which kind of shows the wider narrative to that will be a design and access statement um, with an illustrative master plan within it. And then the environmental impact assessment report. Okay, thank you maybe move a couple of slides forward. So now we're going into the kind of funner bits. <laughs> so the Lesnar site, next slide. So um, South Thames Meet and the Lesnar site is in such an exciting area. Um, you're kind of right there between, um, I guess, you know, the sea and wider countryside, but also on the edge of London and <clears throat> with the greenery right at your doorstep. And perhaps a few ingredients been missing the last few years with not many places to go out and the connection to London could, can, could be better. And all of these things are currently changing and improving and you'll have um, the vibrant um, Southmere village. So um, the area has everything going for it. 
Um, next slide. Thank you. <clears throat> so, but as you all are very familiar with it more even than I am, um, due to the fact that um, the buildings have kind of construction and insulation issues um, and um, I guess have this not very friendly ground floor with all the car parking um, and have this and the area has this very uh, kind of complicated layout that makes it difficult for people to find their way around, particularly in the evening with perhaps not enough lighting. Um, that's why I guess um, Peabody, but also together with you with this ballot have decided for the redevelopment for the area with wonderful ambitions. And then for so the next slide. Um, so when we work on master plans, we always really carefully look at what the context is so that we understand what our proposals are going to have to slot it or, or to slot into so that it's like a jigsaw puzzle piece that really fits in its um, in the existing context. And so when we are looking at the site, what we discovered is that there the this kind of lying rectangle um, has kind of two different qualities on its western side and the eastern side. On the west, it's in this um, new in this strip, which already has a kind of new master plan that you can see uh, becoming reality in South Mir Village, um, which has a um, slightly different scale. is a vibrant new place that connects to um, the station with the fast connection to London. Um, and also along Harrow Manor Way, which really will change its character. And then um, the eastern um, side is relates more to um, Abbey, the, the Green Abbey Way and to the quieter uh, residential areas to the south and uh, to the east, Parkview. <coughs> um, so those two kind of two sides are quite different. Also, all the four edges of this rectangle are all quite different. So we have, as I already said, have Harrow Manor Way, which is busy, but is also going to be in the future kind of positively vibrant. Then Yanton Way, which is going to be a kind of more local road, not so much of a kind of harsh thoroughfare. Then in the east, Abbey with the Green Abbey Way, to which access ought to be easier. Um, and then Lensbury Way, which is a very kind of smaller scale residential street in the south. Next slide, please. And the next one. So we have a, it's a shame that we can't see you all in person because we have this really big <laughs> physical model of the proposals and the wider context. Some of you might have seen this model um, with the, um, I guess that you're, the existing buildings within, but yeah, now it's been filled with a proposal and you can kind of really lean down into it and see what it looks like. Um, I guess, yeah, so it, it depicts the illustrative master plan and this, the vision for this new place. So we're looking from the north, we're looking kind of from the lakeside. So um, on the right, you see the, the western quarter and how it connects to um, South Mir Village. And on the left, um, so on the right with kind of more variety perhaps, and on the left, the slightly lower um, um, and karma part that relates to Abbey Way. Um, but as an idea, I guess we're, we're um, imagining that this is maybe perhaps a slightly more urban place than it is now, but um, a really neighborly um, residential new quarter. Thanks. Next slide. Um, and here in these next two slides, there's, um, we just captured um, the how the two um, parts, the western and the eastern quarter of the proposal might be slightly different. So the western quarter, which I've already said, relates to um, more to South Mere Village, which um, has a few um, uh, shops and cafes along, perhaps along Harrow Manor Way. This one is a view looking from South Mere Village across Yanton Way um, through what um, I guess was already established previously, the idea of, of the quiet way of a route going to the station in parallel to Harrow Manor Way. So we're looking down that route here. So it's a kind of busy, nice place to meet uh, with a new square in the middle. And the next slide, please. And then the Eastern Quarter, um, which is leafy, healthy, kind of nice quiet streets um, where probably kids can play outside and it's well connected to Abbey Way. 
Next slide, please. Irina will uh, pick up from here for a moment. I, um, yeah, I will take you through the um, design principles for um, the Lazarus estate. These design principles are the high level ideas that we have established to translate this vision into a design. Um, and they are established quite early on after understanding the site, but also after speaking with some of you, some of the residents, which have really helped us to understand in which areas the new master plan can contribute to uh, South Spain's need. Um, the first set of principles um, relates to how the new neighborhood um, was locked in with its surroundings. So as uh, Priska said, a bit like a piece of a puzzle, he will have to um, answer to all the conditions of the edges. Um, the first principle is that uh, the new neighborhood will be well connected. Um, so it will really facilitate moving from north-south, so between South Muir Lane and um, Abbey Wood Station, um, and also east-west, so from East Thames Mead uh, onto Abbey Way and the Lesnes Abbey. And to do this, there will be very clear new um, entry points that will align carefully with the existing routes in the neighborhood so that it will be possible to move easily um, across the site. Um, the second principle is that uh, the neighborhood will be easy to navigate. Um, some of the residents told us that um, today the layout of the streets is a bit confusing and it's quite hard to find your way around, especially for um, delivery and um, visitors. So uh, we have uh, thought about a very clear network of streets that will be um, legible and easy to navigate. And the third principle is that the new neighborhood will be integrated with the context because even if it's a new uh, piece of the city, it needs to respond to the different conditions around the sites um, a, a bit as Prisca has uh, previously discussed. The next act of principle um, is more related to the urban fabric, so the layout of the buildings and the public spaces. Um, the neighborhood will be green. One thing that we, uh, it's really outstanding in Thamesmead is the landscape uh, and the green in the surrounding of the site. Um, so the master plan really wants to bring some of these qualities within the uh, new neighborhood. So there will be a number of green squares and uh, neighborhood gardens that are like small green pockets for, that have an intimate scale where residents can meet and are um, separated from the traffic uh, scattered throughout the development. The next principle is that the neighborhood will be based on a rational grid that, that allowed for building efficiency. And this is a quite an important principle because by making the best use of the footprint, so using it very efficiently, it will be possible to accommodate new homes on the site, keeping the um, building height low. The last principle is that the master plan will be varied, but with character. Um, so this means that the new neighborhood will really establish its own identity, but also that each building will develop its own style and its own design, its own design, so that um, they're in the place there will be a bit more variation than perhaps what is uh, currently on the estate. Um, and here I will hand back to Priska for the illustrative master plan. Thank you, Irina. Next slide, please. So what does this mean following these principles in an actual proposal? Um, what, we sh what we're showing here is um, the, a kind of movement um, arrangement across the site. And what you see in the kind of weight of arrows, I guess, is showing that there's a, re there's a, a real hierarchy across these routes as well, um, which I think the estate is currently lacking. At the moment, it's a place where um, there's lots and lots of routes and they all have kind of equal weight. So um, what's happening, oh, yeah, I forget that you can't see my mouse, but you see the um, the heavier purple arrow on the left-hand side. That's the, yeah, thank you, Sarah Jane, that's great. That's the uh, mentioned um, a quiet way, uh, which connects Southmere Village and the lake to the station. And along its way, you can see that there's a new green space um, Coraline Square, there, 
that's right. Then um, we, we're highlighting on the eastern side the route along the top of Abbey Way, um, to which the connection up will be easier and there will be um, uh, access in the right gradients for everyone to be able to get up and um, it's an improved context. And then we have um, retained uh, Volvercott Road because it feels that it's important to connect eastwards um, on a you know, level basis into Park View and also westwards um, at the crossing at the roundabout over to, um, to the west. Um, then there's one um, other important new route that we have identified, the one in the center that's right there, which links basically the bus stop on Yan Way, but also the school to um, uh, Willowbank School and to um, the Bexley Horizon Academy to the south. Somehow felt important that there's a kind of clearer connection there. And then, then there's a number of routes which are kind of secondary within and around the blocks. And someone who's familiar with the area might go kind of zigzaggy diagonally across and someone who's new might follow one of these really straight lines. Um, the diagram on the right shows the, um, the, uh, just the car axis that goes um, through the site. And, uh, and it shows that there's some routes or some yeah, routes in which there's, there won't be any car traffic because it's required there. Um, so um, kind of going around these routes enables all the servicing and picking up um, bins and rubbish and accessing car parking and so on. But it means that certain places can be car free and pedestrian and bikes only. Next slide, please. And um, Marika is going to talk us through some landscape. So yeah, hello. So we are going to look at the streets now and the square. So our first slide um, showing the green streets is just I wanted to explain what these streets might look and what they might feel like. What is very important for us that these streets are for people. We are aware that there will be cars, but predominantly we wanted to make these um, streets playable, cyclable and walkable. But each of these streets will still have a little different character. So some might be more intimate, others might be direct, others might be active and others might be just very planted out but all of them will be having planting and trees and that's to soften the, the streets, but also to bridge the scale to the buildings from a more higher point of view to the humane scale for children and us. And then each of them with the um, amount of planting and the trees should also bring us a little bit closer to nature, which we think over the last couple of months or the last year, I think we were all became aware of how important it is to being close to nature and seeing the different um, changes throughout the season. And then another aspect that is really important for us for all of these streets is um, integrating water and water management in all of these in all of these streets. And um, I will explain a little bit more just looking at this view in a minute. But um, first of all, on your right, if we just um, go over to the right with the mouse as well, we're just wanting to explain the different ingredients of each of the streets. And each of the streets will have a set of ingredients that are identical, but they will be sort of applied in different ways to each of the streets, so all of them will feel different and have their own character. So if we move um, from left to right, maybe, so each of the streets will have a private area or a garden outside the front door. Then there will be a pathway, which is roughly about two meters adjacent to it, and then we will have a strip because we do have to think about cars that integrate cars within the street cave that is sort of buffered by planting on each side. So it's sort of merged within the soft appearance of the streets. Then you will have your carriageway, which differs from 4 to 8, 4.8 to 5.5 meters. And then, as you can see at the corner of that plant, there is a little kink which allows for traffic calming. So these streets will be very slow moving in terms of traffic speed. Then you will have your planted strip with mature trees that will equally be applicable to all of the streets of the um, neighborhood. And then you have your pathway again, equally two to three meters, and then either a private garden or a privacy zone. And then all these principles are translated now in the view to your left hand side. And if maybe we can move again from the left to the right. 
So what becomes really clear in these streets, this is one of the streets that is in the Western um, quarter. That's one of the quiet streets where you can see that we want to encourage people to come out, people to come together in the future eventually and um, when we can meet again and see each other again and be out and about and be close to nature and be um, allowed to play on the streets as well. So if we now move to from left, you see the privilege zones that's kind of hugging the edge of the buildings then you would have your pathway on this one we're integrating the water or water management within the planted zone so we call this a planted ditch or a rain garden where water would just sort of drain into this area but it can equally be utilized for play for planting and then for tree planting just to yeah, make it all a little bit softer and what is very special about these sort of snapshots is these little bridges at the front so they're all you can just cut across and just everything reads from building edge to building edge as public run streetscape. And then you have your street in the middle and then you see kind of tucked away that there is a car. So car parking is integrated, is a vital part of the whole development, but these pockets before kind of screen the car. So they become secondary and pedestrian and cyclists become you know, more important when you look at these streets. And then you would have your pathway again and your privacy zone or garden to the other edge. So the 18 meters you see on that section is demonstrated that the public rhyme or the streetscape would go from building edge to building edge instead of yeah, pinching areas from the privacy zone. And then if we go to the next slide, and this then translates how the movement along the um, green street, some of them being very direct, some of them more quiet, more meandering, always sort of gets you from place to place, which are these gardens and little squares. And there's a series of different squares. Some of them are very quiet, others are very active. Some of them are small, some of them are bigger. But the idea is if we go to the left bottom corner, if you were to arrive from Abbey Wood Station, you would see the rival square right from the beginning. That is the kind of welcoming entrance into the new neighborhood. That then takes you up all the way, the quiet way, as we're calling it at the moment, into the development. And you would get a glimpse of Caroline Square, which is the big new community square. We would have some play and seating and landform and water management over there. And then you would have a series of little entrance gone along Yarton Way these three ones that allow to get little glimpses into the new neighborhood, but also make the visual link over to South Mill Village. And then you can be yeah, into these two neighborhood garden. So you would have two sets of neighborhood garden that are specifically related to the um, Western corner and then one to the Eastern corner. And they have slightly different character, but what is um, what all of them have together is that they do not have any car movement. So children can come out and play. You feel safe in these spaces and they will be green and then we'll give into the community and feel very quiet, except Caroline Way and um, the Arrival Square, which are very public and very active and very inviting to, to people coming, visiting and people who live here. And then, so this, um, yeah, is relating to these three or a series of these three squares we just talked about and just to make it easier, so the one on the left is Caroline Square, so you can see the extent of the square. It's a very, very big square. There will be trees, fairly large trees, right from the beginning to feel or give the sense of an established landscape right from the beginning. There will be play, there will be seating, but equally we will respect the privacy zones to each of the buildings, so you feel part of the square, but you still feel, you know, it's your own privacy. It's not going to get imposed on by people walking past and playing in the square. And then the one in the center is talking about these active and playable moments along each of the routes that we're going to get within the neighborhood. So you could do some yeah, sports, you could jump, you know, or if you're a child, you can just go on stepping stones, which are um, situated along the swale, and each journey becomes playable. And then the one on the right is illustrating and the entrance gun from Yanton Way. So you do get these glimpses into a green leafy neighborhood. And what we are... Um, in terms of yeah, easing navigation orientation as having these large mature trees at junctions of roads so people can orientate themselves and know which way to go. So trees in itself and the section of the species of the trees aids wayfinding and legibilities throughout the neighborhood in the future. 
And then on the next slide, this, um, Priska touched on this before, how we're seeing the whole estate and looking at the edges as well. And Abbey Way as one of the green amazing assets kind of hugging um, Les Ness estate is fully, or we're kind of seeing it in the future to be fully integrated with an, um, our proposals and our thinking. It's through subtle improvements like having meadow planting and tree planting added to the existing Abbey Way and obviously yeah, improving accessibility. So you have direct links from Abbey Way that are DDI compliant, but then equally links that go straight back into the neighborhood. So there is this connectivity between the new neighborhood and then the ex existing green spaces within the vicinity. And I think I'm gonna hand back to Priska at this yes, point. Yes, thank you. Talk. Yeah. Great. I will just talk you briefly um, a little bit through the idea of what kind of building typologies uh, occur within the master plan, even though some of this is also um, obviously will be developed further in every detailed application as they come forward. But the master plan is based, as you can see here, on this idea of, of perimeter blocks. So perimeter blocks are buildings where you get, I guess they're apartment buildings, which wrap around an internal courtyard, which I will show in, on the next slide in a moment. It's, it's raised because it has car parking underneath it, but it's always landscaped. So there's always um, a group of, I guess here we're indicating, you know, for, always kind of four apartment buildings around an internal courtyard to which only the residents of that um, group of four buildings would have access to. Um, and so that would also ensure that, you know, there's outward facing um, um, kind of activity from the, from the blocks, but also this internal, more private area. And then you see at the um, um, on Lensbury Way, the eastern end there, it, yeah, it stands out that it looks slightly different there. There we're proposing a group of houses. So they are actually houses because they're sitting in the vicinity of the houses on Lensbury Way. And the same happens at the um, at the end of um, um, Overton Road there, yeah, that's right, there um, to just kind of fold um, the same topology just round into the quiet way. Next slide, please. Um, and this diagram perhaps illustrates a bit more clearly what kind of buildings there could be. So you can see here in that um, left-hand diagram, um, um, a kind of section through it at the same time, there would be a, probably a kind of big communal entrance into the flats above, but also as you can see on the right hand side, um, we generally um, propose that and, and also on the investor diagram, in both of them on the right hand side, is that on the ground floor of all of these buildings we're proposing to have um, masonettes. So and masonettes would work in the way that they would have their, um, for example, their kitchen and the, so they would have their own private front door onto the street to a front garden and they would have the kitchen on the ground floor, but then they would have a stair up and the living room which would face out to the courtyard where you'd have a um, small private terrace and, and the bedrooms also on these upper levels. So that would ensure that um, the, um, the streets and the footpaths are all kind of overlooked by activities and kitchens and doors are open and people can chat to each other, um, but privacy still retains through front gardens. Um, and also what you can see very clearly here in this section on the left is the, is the car parking under this landscape deck. And that maybe we move to the next slide also becomes clear in this ground floor plan. So here, all these kind of gray areas at the center of the block are providing car parking to each group of buildings. Um, and what else can we see here? There's bicycle parking integrated and, and bin stores and everything that, um, that is needed for a building to work well. Um, also maybe just what's interesting to point out in this drawings on the left hand side, the kind of darker orange along Long Harrow Manor Way and um, in the building next to Coraline Square, that's right. There, it, the proposal is for um, non-residential uses or so commercial uses potentially can be there. Um, next slide, please. No, hold, yeah, no, next slide. And this is, um, sorry, we've already talked loads. Um, and this is an opportunity for, to, for, a, for a break for some 
Q&A to be discussed on this basis before we go into the more kind of volume three-dimensional side of the master plan in a moment. Okay, thank you, Priska. Um, so we do actually have um, quite a few questions. So I will read them out and then hopefully you guys can answer them between you. Um, so the first question, and I actually have two of a similar ilk, so I'll read them both out. So um, two questions. I'd like to know about local power regeneration. All these homes have solar power and local battery storage. Um, and then just to follow that up, I have another question about um, what's the plan around energy, i.e. does the master plan include renewable community energy creation to reduce the cost of living for residents, um, in addition to insulation and energy efficiency and address climate change. Similarly, what building materials are going to be used and what will the climate footprints of the buildings be across the lifetime of the buildings? And how has environmental sustainability been incorporated? Sorry, that's quite a long one. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm happy to answer this one. Okay. Um, in terms of energy, uh, the overall strategy, due to the time frames that are involved in the project, we may not start building the first phase for kind of four or five years and the final phase may not be completed for, for 15 years. Um, we're keeping the options fairly open in order to be responsive to changes in technology, changes in policy um, over that period. Um, but there are a number of options that we are considering through our energy strategy. The first one of which is to, um, that there's a, an energy center, not an energy center, there's an incinerator on the river called um, Cory um, Riverside Recovery, Resource Recovery Center. Um, and they generate a lot of waste heat at the moment, which is not currently being captured. So we're exploring opportunities with Cory to potentially connect up as part of a heat network, the, the site and the master plan to, to that resource. Another option we're looking at, and we're, we're trying to really move away from options that involve um, carbon intensive um, energy. Uh, another one we're looking at is using heat from the ground, so ground source heat. Um, so there are a number of different ways that can be implemented and we're testing it um, at the moment uh, on another site that we're developing with uh, Barclay Homes in, in Plumstead. And that's where you draw heat up from the ground um, and use uh, heat pumps to extract um, the existing heat and kind of intensify the, the, the existing heat in the ground to um, heat individual homes. Um, and we may also be looking at other op opportunities such as air source heat, but all of the options that we're looking at are really don't involve um, traditional heating, like there'll be no gas boilers, there won't even be kind of gas powered energy centers unless they're kind of used as a backup. Um, so we really want to kind of move away from, from carbon intensive options and that also extends to use of building materials, so um, where possible we want to use building materials that have a very low embodied energy. As we're not designing any of the buildings at the moment in detail, the there will be a kind of what we call a life cycle carbon analysis that's undertaken. So that's considering the entire impact of using that particular material, the proposed materials that we're looking into for different technologies of building at a later phase. And we'll be looking to reduce the amount of carbon that um, those materials um, use up in their, in their life cycle as much as we possibly can. Um, and then with the overall strategy towards sustainability, a lot of the measures that we're taking, and I think Prisco and um, Mara can probably expand upon this, but are really about holistically baking in the idea of sustainability to the very design and the very fabric of the building. So all about kind of how they're orientated to um, reduce energy consumption um, and make the best of the kind of natural environment through kind of nature-based solutions, through landscaping, improving biodiversity, um, all of it is, some, is um, they're all strategies that we're kind of holistically trying to bring through that will be considered further through the detailed design later on. <clears throat> yes, perhaps much, maybe just to add to that, um, I mean, I think all the, um, the, the street network is laid out to really encourage cycling um, as well as um, providing a cycle parking easily accessible to every core um, so it's, it's um, really encouraging sustainable ways of getting around. Um, then there's also the intention that the um, that some of the the concrete that is of the buildings which are being demolished gets all reused as an aggregate in the, in future production of concrete. 
Um, and then I thought what would also be important to point out perhaps is even though um, there are these um, holistic solutions to energy, still every home has full control over heating. It does not, it's, not, it's not like in an, some old estate where somehow <laughs> the heating's turned on and every home turns hot. <laughs> it's individually controllable. Yeah. So just to kind of follow that up, you sort of touched on that briefly, Priska, um, around cycling. So um, another question um, was easy to navigate. Um, will that include bike lanes and cycle provision, which I think. Correct, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, um, maybe maybe that on this one as well. I think we're proposing a range of kind of visitor cycling as well, where we're looking at cargo bikes. So we do yeah, want to encourage people generally yeah, to use the car less and then use the cycles, not just for going to places, but taking their kids or doing their shopping. So there will be the holistic thinking that cycles are part of everyday life and the routes are designed that you are encouraged to walk to cycle wherever you can along these green line streets. <laughs> So there are so the the way that the streets are laid out, um, um, and because there's no which I missed to mention when I talked about the uh, car routes across the site, there's no actual through route from um, the entry point at Yanton Way and the entry point from Haramene Way. They're two uh, one-way loops which are not interconnected. So therefore, there really won't be any kind of fast car traffic cutting through it using it as a shortcut so there's no segregated cycle paths intended currently within the site but there's obviously a new cycle paths along Yanton Way which is segregated and on Yarn and, and on Harrow Manor Way. But then the streets within the new neighborhood they will have a lot of planted traffic calming measures so even you know if you do have to share the road with the car um, the cars would have to go at such a slow speed to navigate these traffic calming measures that it is the priority is for cyclists and pedestrians. And therefore, yeah, invite people to come into the estate and cycle to either the doors or go to the station, go shopping or go to Southmere Village. Lovely. Thank you. Um, so we have another question. And Adam, this came quite early on, I think, when you were doing your intro. So I think this is to do with Southmere Village. So the question was, when do you estimate some of the shops and cafes to be ready to open? I think I might pass this one over to Matt, if he's, if he can sign his camera. Here I come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks, Adam. Um, so, yeah, so obviously Southmere is going to be the first phase that's going to complete. And so we've got one unit which is due to hand over to us uh, in May. So so very soon. Um, and we haven't signed contracts with anybody at the moment, but we are exploring options that do in potentially include a cafe type use. But that's the only commercial unit that will actually be available to us um, this year. Um, the remainder and it is about another sort of you know 13 14 commercial spaces that we're building around that new public square they're actually due to hand over to us um between spring next uh, spring 2022 and the end of 2022 so it will be a phased process and what we'll be doing is working with our commercial agents but also um with peabody's socio-economic team um to obviously try and line up um tenants and a sustainable mix of uses for those spaces that will really sort of activate the square and give give people something to do. I mean, you know, a lot of the feedback we get from the community is that there just isn't enough for people to do. There's not enough places to meet and gather. Um, so, you know, so we will be sort of looking to introduce cafes, perhaps a food and beverage offer. Um, you know, is there an opportunity to introduce some health and fitness and leisure? So if anyone's got any sort of suggestions of what they would like to see at Southmere, now is the right time to, uh, to approach us. So we can uh, obviously try and deliver what the community are after, albeit it will be be a very challenging um challenging time for for retail at the moment i think but um but yeah hopefully that answers the question anyway thanks matt um there is another question which is connected to that and i wonder if that um, may be about the commercial offer or if there'll be a commercial offer in les the new lesnar estate so it's um, a question saying is there any, going to be anything available um for business so i assume that's about commercial units so yes yeah, so, i mean and and the majority of you know southmere um phase one is really what we're seeing is the civic heart, the new civic centre of, um, you know, our wider master plan proposals for South Thamesmead. Uh, and we're delivering that in the first phase. 
but as Prisca did mention, we are allowing for additional um, non-residential spaces within the Lesnes master plan as well. They don't necessarily have to be commercial. There is the opportunity for them to be residential. It really depends on the market at the time. But because we are working to such a large long-term complex master plan, we've left that flexibility in intentionally. Um, thank you, Matt. And also there is another one which is very similar, which is um, about a new shop to replace the old corner shop. Um, which was on the corner of Overton Road, um, or would be houses built on that area? Um, so the honest answer is don't know, Prisca. I think you just flashed up a, a, the, the perfect plan. Maybe somebody else did. But so at that tail end, yeah, exactly. You can see sort of that um, exactly where that um, sort of boot shaped uh, darker orange section is. So that's roughly where the old sort of corner shop used to be. And you can see the master plan is still allowed for it to be non-residential use. Um, what that use is, you know, it's far too early for us to say, um, but obviously the potential is there for it to not be residential. So, um, yeah, I'm afraid I can't be more specific at this time. Um, and just also, again, following off on that, do you have any idea how long it will be before we build something at the end of Overton Road? Uh, that end of Overton Road is in phase five. So, Adam, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we were looking at PC dates 2030 and beyond for, for that phase. Okay, thank you. Um, so next question, are we working with broadband providers like Hyperoptic to ensure gigabyte fiber, gigabyte fiber, sorry, to every new home? So obviously the, as part of this master plan, we're not having those specific conversations, but Peabody have got a whole town approach across Thamesmead. So obviously that includes working um, and making sure that we've got the right infrastructure so, to support, you know, the regeneration and, and the community as we all grow together. Um, so we're not talking, as far as I'm aware, we're not talking to hyper optic specifically, but obviously most broadband providers use BT OpenReach. So we are working with BT OpenReach to ensure that, you know, the right infrastructure improvements are going ahead and and for example, the um, the highway improvement works, the Harrow Manor Way, they have included and allowed for channels for BT to come in and upgrade their infrastructure at the right time. Thank you, Matt. Um, so also I've got a question about, will there be charging points for electric cars? Um, most cars being sold by the time these are built will be EV, um, need to be seven kilowatt charging points at a minimum, I reckon. Yeah, so there will be... Um... Initially, there'll be 20% of the car parking spaces will have electric um, charging provision installed. And initially, these are likely to be within the car parking podiums. Um, but 100% of the car parking spaces will have what we call passive provision. So that's the infrastructure put in place, ready to be converted at any point in time when the demand is, is um, necessary um, for it to be converted to a full car charging point. Thanks, Adam. Um, so next question. Um, I strongly agree with Mariette's um, comments on the importance of integrating nature. The regeneration of South Mere Lake has been encouraging, but litter and fly tipping has left reed beds suboptimal for wildlife nesting. What is the strategy for the maintenance of the green spaces in the new development? So in terms of Lesnes, again, obviously it's long term. Um, but if we take what we're, what we're doing at Southmere phase one and an example, you know, we've got our own in-house um, environmental estate management team. So they're responsible for, for managing, you know, all the green spaces, the lakes, the communal areas, you know, litter is a problem. Um, and it's one that we really do struggle to tackle. And we really do need the help of the community uh, in order to tackle it. Um, but they're extremely well resourced. We are always, you know, you know, are the discussions around South Mirror are, okay, what do we need to make sure that this space, you know, continues to be well looked after, well managed, that the litter is collected. And at times, I think Tom Broad, who manages that team, does feel it's a bit of an uphill battle. But, you know, it's <laughs> something that we are very, very conscious on, of. And, uh, you know, Peabody are here for the long term. So we're invested in making sure that what we build continues to look fantastic into the future and you know across London some of our estates are over 100 years old and we're still looking after them so hopefully that will give you some comfort that we are on it but obviously there's room for improvement. Thank you 
I think just to add to that, one of the reasons why fly tipping occurs around the estate at the moment is because of this lack of overlooking. It's because there's a lot of kind of um, tall fences and blank walls at the ground level. And part of the purpose of kind of redesigning the streets so they're much more active, they have many more front doors, is they'll be much more overlooked. And that in itself will hopefully discourage fly tipping from occurring in the future. And also just from a slightly different angle, I think we are fairly aware that the water tables are very low. So the species that are chosen and why we're wanting to integrate so many planted ditches is to deal with maintenance. But then equally, the planting palette is building on low maintenance, but yet robust species selection. And equally, we are fully aware of climate change. So there will be a mix between evergreen, native and non-native species to think about the future and being able yeah, to deal with climate change when it gets warmer. So in terms of maintenance, maintenance and the species selection. I think that all goes hand in hand in these proposals. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I'm quite conscious of time. So just a couple more really quick questions. Um, will the flats be managed by concierge? Do we know this yet? We don't know that yet specifically because obviously we're a long way off, you know, for finalising an estate management strategy. But again, in Southmere phase one, there will be a concierge. So and, I, you know, I think it will be manned at all times, but actually open as a concierge for 16 hours a day. So, yeah, if you take that as a, as a sort of example of the way Peabody approaches it. Wonderful. And I'm hoping when you can answer this really quickly, when will the new library go? Uh, next year. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, thanks guys. Um, so um, Priska, are we going to continue? Yes, Irina, we'll start. Yeah. Um, yeah. So now, up until now, we have been uh, presenting you the master plan in his plan layout. Um, and in the next section, I will describe our approach to building heights and height strategy. Um, first of all, um, first of all, um, there is an image here to remind of uh, um, the situation today. Uh, we can see a quite a stark contrast between most of the buildings that at the moment are between two and five stories um, and a few very iconic 13 stories towers, which are um, creating a very iconic skyline um, at the lake and also that uh, highlight um, Yarton Way, which was an important connection, uh, an important highway connection in the past. Um, next to the aerial view, we can see an image that is an image from the archives. So it's an image from the 70s um, with uh, these towers in the background. And so these whole points really have been in the background of Thamesmead for more than 50 years. And as many tall buildings do, they create a very important sense of orientation. So they are immediately recognizable, both from Lesnes Abbey, but also coming out from Abbey Wood Station. And so they give a point of reference. But when we think about a new master plan, um, we don't only think about the past, but we also think about uh, how the wider neighborhood will grow in the future. Um, in fact, uh, because of the new connections into central London uh, through Abbey Wood, Abbey Wood Station, um, South, uh, South Thamesmead will mostly grow along Harrow Manor Way. So around the, um, in, the, in the picture around this um, street. Uh, and we see in the, um, in the image how a new development will uh, happen around, um, around this street and how uh, South Mere Village is already on site uh, while other buildings like this I am highlighting right now um, already have a planning consent. Um, with uh, the uh, Lesnes master plan, um, there ha we have made a quite clear decision to move away from the idea of having very tall buildings along uh, um, Yarton Way, as it was historically. Um, and the heights have been uh, spread more evenly across the side. So there are less buildings as tall as 13 stories. Um, and the average height is between uh, five and six stories, which we feel is a very familiar scale, which is very common across um, cities in the UK, even though we are aware it's uh, slightly different from what is currently on site. Um, in these diagrams, we see uh, that also buildings that are slightly taller than five or six stories, so something around eight stories or nine stories, um, have been carefully located. Um, they are concentrated mostly um, in the western part of the site. Um, and this is both because um, they tie in with the character of Southmere 
uh, village on the north, but also because taller buildings in this way are mm, closer to the station and so they have more direct connection to public transport. In the second diagram, we see that also taller buildings have been located um, along main uh, um, connections. So to emphasize our manor way, um, uh, Yarton way, even though less uh, tall building than there were before, and also on uh, um, Abbey way. So overlooking uh, the beautiful green skies. Moreover, in the last uh, uh, image, we see how tall buildings also are used as a marker. And again, as I was uh, mentioning before for orientation, so they really are used to signal um, points of entrance to um, uh, the new estate, to give orientation, and also to mark important public spaces. So for instance, the two um, radish uh, buildings that are uh, in this diagram, they are, they are marking um, Coraline Square and the Arrival Square. In this um, overall view, we can see how um, building heights and building heights are distributed and how buildings are in a three-dimensional view. So um, as Priska mentioned before, um, some of the uh, building in the south, so along uh, Lansbury Way and on Overton Road are three stories uh, um, houses to respond and to be sensitive to the houses, um, to the two-story houses on the south of the site. There is only one building that is 13 stories, so as tall as um, the um, towers at the, on the site at the moment. Um, and we can also see that there is a, almost a checkup board pattern um, to, um, for the other taller buildings uh, so that they are evenly distributed and uh, they never face each other on a street making uh, the street feel too tight. We have also um, presented uh, you some, here some precedents, so some buildings that have already uh, been built. This is St. John's Hill in Clapham, which is a Peabody's uh, building. And this is helpful for us to give you a sense of what the, feel, the street uh, uh, proportion uh, feel like. So on uh, the uh, left-hand side, we can see a view from within a home um, across. So there is an opportunity there to make an idea of what will be the sense of privacy and what will be the distance from uh, the closest building from inside the house. Um, and on the uh, right hand side, we can see um, a street, uh, excuse me, um, we can see a street uh, from, we can see the street from the street. In this case, um, the street is 16 meters wide, so actually it's slightly narrower um, than what is proposed in Lasnes, which is 18 meters, so slightly wider. Um, but this gives a good sense of the proportions of the street. In this next slide, we have another example, which is a McRunner Lavington building, St. Andrews and Bow. Um, and this is an example of a street that is um, also the uh, comparable um, dimensions, so between 14 and 19 meters. And in this case, um, it has also um, a building that are almost as high as in Lesnes, but there is also a taller building at the end of the street. And uh, this image, uh, um, in the, with this image, we want to show how having buildings that are taller, but that are not central in the view, but uh, remain lateral on the street, um, they also don't feel too prominent. Um, so this is the same uh, type of approach that we got for Lesnes. Um, and now I will hand uh, back to Priska again, that will take you through the views. Thank you, Irina. This leaves me to with the last bit of the presentation and it's an enjoyable walk around some views of um, of the proposals. Um, we're kind of going around the edges and then to the inside. Um, next slide, we're starting on Yarnton Way and um, you will see there's always a kind of small picture of the situation currently and then a kind of future vision. So looking at this here, you can see um, what we talked about earlier, the segregated cycle route. The proposal is for it to sit between um, a green strip and then a, a pavement to the left and um, a narrow front garden zone to any homes in the buildings there, which would all be maisonettes and would have their main living spaces on the first floor. 
in the next slide. So, so there's quite a considerable amount of tree planting, I guess, envisaged along that on Ganten Way. Then you've already seen this image earlier, um, Abbey Way. Um, next slide, please. Then um, Lensbury Way um, would have, um, so at the moment on Lensbury Way, you only get the kind of side flanks, flank walls of the existing buildings and um, a lot of head on car parking. So in the future, um, the idea is that there's um, tree planting and kind of integrated car parking bays and um, houses facing onto the street. Uh, next slide. Um, and this is the view that someone actually in one of the questions earlier kind of asked about the corner of Overton Road. Um, so on the left, you see the route up along Harrow Manor Way, and then also to the right is the kind of entry point into what we call the Quiet Way. And then with the um, the awnings kind of indicate the uh, this unit on the ground floor, which perhaps you know one could easily imagine being a cafe south facing onto this uh, little arrival square. Um, but as we've heard, it might still be quite a long way in the future. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Um, and that's also view you've seen earlier. So that's coming from the north, from um, um, Southmere Village, down into the Western Quarter, along the Quiet Way, through Coral Line Square, crossing over Yanton Way. And next slide, please. And that's um, Coral Line Square. So from the picture before, we would have come from the top left hand corner there. Um, I think Marika has talked about that before with kind of play areas and grass and big trees, but all residential units around it would still have front gardens. Next slide, please. And this is a few um, looking westwards along Volvercourt Road. So Volvercourt Road in its current location, but with a green strip of planting along it as well. And then kind of turning left into the residential streets. Next slide, please. Um, and again, you've seen this one before. So this is in the Eastern Quarter, one of the residential streets looking down to the houses near um, Lensbury Way. Um, I think Marike has explained all the in ingredients of this one. And I'm not sure whether we've got another one. I think, I think we've traveled around the site. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. Thank you, Priska. That was really, really interesting. Um, actually, I think we might have answered all the questions in that first session. So I don't currently have any more Q and A's. Um, so I don't know if there's anyone else um, on the panel who wants to add anything, who wants to say anything extra than they've already said. Um, what I will do if you kind of, so if anybody, oh, we've just had a, a question flash up. Um, oh, it's a suggestion around what we might want to see in South Mid Village. Um, thank you. Um, about possibly a soft play area with an outdoor gym, which is a lovely suggestion. Thank you. Um, so, but if you kind of come off the call and you perhaps think of something that you didn't ask at the time, um, I will put the email address, our contact email address in the chat. Um, um, so obviously that you can ask some questions if any questions arise later um, that you can ask. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. There's quite a few of you, so I'm really, really pleased about that. It's actually the first webinar we've done. So really, really nice um, that you've chose to join us. Um, and what we will do is, as I said, I will. Um, oh, OK, so I have a question. Sorry, one yeah, just popped up. Oh, I've got two now. <laughs> Let's, uh, we're happy to um, hang on for a moment for people to. Of course. Um, to type. So, yeah, of course. So, okay, so I've got the question, what are the plans for opposite Hearts Lock Drive? That is where the, the ball court is, up, where, the, where Hearts Lock Drive, that's opposite, um, where the Wolvercourt Roads multi-use games arena is. So there are plans to refurbish that um, and kind of resurface it. Um, Obviously, we're thinking about kind of the entrance sequence to to Wolvercourt Road and, and kind of improving the access for for cars and um, improving the access for pedestrians as well. Because at the moment they have to kind of walk across each other. Um, so that's something that we're kind of looking at more holistically as Peabody. Um, but that part of the site is in itself within the red line boundary of the of the master plan. Thank you, Adam. Um... 
also another question um what's life going to be like for us while the work is going on um so as part of our phased rehousing strategy we are really aware that there is going to be some disruption along the way um obviously we're looking to minimize that as far as as is as is practical and as is possible through the kind of phasing strategy um we're looking to move residents of each phase out of their homes and into one of the new homes that we're building in Southmere village initially um so a lot of residents will be moving off site before the works take place to their specific area but where there are kind of adjacencies of construction we'll be looking really carefully through the detailed design phase um, and into construction how we manage that how we account for things like dust noise and really putting in as far as we can kind of best practice in terms of um, being considerate through through the construction process thank you adam um so currently, um, okay. Um, so we have I have no more questions. Um, so shall we wrap up there if everyone's happy? Um, and as I said, I will put the email in the chat box. Oh no, another one's popped up. Obviously, waiting for people to type. Um, okay. Um, so this one is about antisocial behaviour. So antisocial behaviour is a major problem in the area. Are there any strategies to prevent or manage this in the future? I, I suppose one thing to to say, which I, I've already touched upon, really, is is um, about design and really trying to design out the opportunities for crime to take place. Um, so, from going from an environment where a lot of the streets feel a little bit like a, a maze, and there's lots of alleyways, they all, there's a lot of kind of similar looking streets. It's quite easy for people to. Um, find kind of blind corners. We're really looking to move away from that and to a much more street space master plan where you've kind of got longer longer fields of view. Um, they're much more overlooked. Really think carefully about how we implement lighting in the neighborhoods um, and to think about where we kind of consider opportunities for, for, for things like play to take place as well. So we can really kind of design out crime. And that really goes down to like the level of detailed design of buildings as well, thinking about access and safety and security. Um, and also working with our wardens, um, our team of wardens at Peabody, who in addition to kind of police and community support officers really kind of try to improve security and safety in the area. Lovely. Thanks, Adam. Okay, so I think I'm going to wrap that up there. As I said, I will put the email address in the chat right now. If you want to email us, you can, absolutely can. Um, I just want to say thank you again for all of you for joining us and thanks to our panel. You've been amazing. It's been really interesting. Um, and also we've recorded the session, so this will be going, we'll put it online on our um, website. So if you do want to watch back or somebody's missed it, you please do, um, you can watch back and find it on our website. I will we'll put a link up. Okay. So I'm just going to type now the email address before we close, because otherwise I'm going to lose you. <laughs> you could also add the feedback form link. I'll, I'll put the feedback form link in the chat as well for the consultation. So okay. we'll capture all of that information if you haven't already commented. I also would like to say thank you to everyone for joining today. Right, for people kind of kind of <laughs> coming out to an event <laughs> yeah. well, staying in for an event <laughs> that's right <laughs> <Dialing> in, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs>